Hello and welcome back to the Neil Bailey Rides YouTube channel. I'm Neil Bailey, he's Dave Collier, and uh, we have a pretty cool show for you. Yeah, look at this thing, huh? This is the 2021 Husqvarna TX300. It's like looking into the future. And it's freaking amazing. Well, the thing is, is like we're so slow at getting the shows out. We have to yeah. get 2021s on so that they're actually mm -hmm. relevant when we finally get ready. Right, to yeah. By the time we edit and we're done, it's a full year forward. So, so next week we'll have a 2022 Husqvarna TX300. <laughs> it's a great idea. Let's do so it. That way we can keep continuity and have the right bike in the right year. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, beautiful bike. Can't wait to learn more about it. Uh, we've got Terry from 10 Cycles here to give us the full rundown. All I know is it is a fuel injected two stroke, which makes it borderline magic. Right, and unlike your cocktails, you don't have to mix the two stroke with the petroleum because yeah. yeah. it does it for you. So yeah, you go to just, the bar. Just pour it straight into the highball glass and boom, bing. Yes, done. You're standing around with a petrol can mixing up two stroke oil. Nope, just get just right brilliant. to it. Just brilliant. Also on the show, we have some giveaways. We have some cool shameless plugs. Awesome. And um, we have the news. Right. So I think what we'll do is we will send you off to get ready for the news. Got we'll it. We'll bring Terry on, and then uh, we're going to learn a bit about Terry. He is actually the director of fun for 10 Cycles. Director of fun, so I like that. going to be cool. And I he's going to tell us a bit about the Husqvarna too. Awesome. Well, welcome to the main event. Terry Slifer, he is the director of fun at 10 Cycles here in Charlotte. And uh, you might have seen Terry in previous videos talking about 10 Cycles or in the videos that we've been making about the Husqvarna project. So right. phenomenally interesting guy. Um, he is the son of a diplomat and a journalist. And by the time he was 15 years of age, having been born in Bangkok, Thailand, yep. he had been in more than 30 countries around the world. So, having actually really not lived in America until college age, you're known as a third culture child, right? Yeah, that's so, the technical term for the people that grew up like I did. The good news is he is in the motorcycle culture, so now he has us as his extended family. So, he kindly bought this uh, Husqvarna TX300i for us to have a look at, tell us a little bit about it. And Terry's going to tell us a little bit about his life in travel, mountain bike racing, motorcycling, and how you kind of came to be at 10 Cycles as the director of fun. Yeah, yeah. So Terry, lead on. You started in Bangkok, traveled the world, came back to America college. Yeah, so I was, uh, I was born in Bangkok in, uh, in the early 70s uh, during the Vietnam War. My, my dad was stationed in uh, Cambodia, mm -hmm. so uh, my mom was a journalist, so Cambodia wasn't super safe in 1970, so uh, my mom went to Bangkok to have me, and from there we kind of moved all over the world, mostly third world countries, Southeast Asia, East Africa, um, sort of came back to the United States permanently in 1989 when I um, came to go to college. But that exposure in, these, in the developing world was how you came to motorcycles, so by the, what, by the age of seven or eight you were riding small motorcycles, bicycles, because it's so cultural for people to Yeah, ride. you know, in, in third world countries, bicycles and motorcycles are by far the majority of the transportation, so that was always my way to kind of fit into whatever culture I was dropped into. Mm -hmm. um, I could ride a bike and I could ride a motorcycle, and that helped me fit in really wherever I was. Uh, because I was always an outsider. Mm. So you rode motorcycles in college? Yeah, I rode, I've been riding my whole life. Um, you know, on a competitive side is where I, is my, my bicycling and mostly yeah. mountain biking. So I raced in college, I raced out of college for a few years and then like everyone else, life gets in the way and marriage and jobs and so I got a little away from the, the motorcycle riding and the mountain bike riding for probably five, six, five, six years and then you know, picked it back up in my early 30s, mid 30s and uh, kind of dove back in full, full effort. So you have actually raced mountain bikes nationally all over the country? Yeah, pretty competitive. I would say you know, locally, uh, very competitive, regionally, uh, again, very competitive. Uh, I've raced in some national level of level events, some national championships, mm. uh, some top tens. So I had a pretty pretty good career. Mm. Interestingly enough, you know, 
a lot of motorcycle racers ride bicycles. I mean, uh, tremendous. Your amount. boss, Justin Brayton, supercross racer, he's a big bicyclist. And it was actually the bicycle that led you to 10 cycles because of your connection with Ryan Kelly, one of the uh, owners of the shop or the investor in the shop. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I was racing in the local mountain bike scene, and uh, there's a lot of crossover between mountain biking and, and dirt bikes. Uh, both skill sets help translate to, to each other. So you see a lot of crossover and I started seeing Justin at some races, mountain bike races, and I sort of knew who he was. He was a pro motocross racer and, you know, I was racing against Ryan and some of his clients. He was a coach and I always did well against him. So he, he approached me and wanted to know what I was doing from a training standpoint. And, you know, we had a lot of similarities and we talked about motorcycles and we figured out we both had these same passions for really anything two wheels. Um, and so that's sort of how our relationship started with mountain bikes and then led into the motorcycle world. And this was all around 2016, about what year, two years before 10 Cycles opened? Yeah, so we opened last January officially. We probably weren't mm -hmm. operational until about May, but the whole process probably started for me back in 2016. Mm -hmm probably for Ryan and Justin maybe a few years before that. Mm. And so essentially this is sort of for Justin when he retires from Supercross that he's got a, a career path in the motorcycle industry. Yeah, for those that aren't familiar with Supercross, it's a very young uh, man's sport. Uh, most of the riders and racers are under the age of 30. Mm. It's very rare to s see someone go past the age of 30. I think there's only two right now. Uh, Justin and Chad Reed. Mm -hmm. uh, so Justin's one of the older guys. He's actually the oldest professional racer to win a Supercross race. Mm -hmm. He won Daytona in 2019 or 2018. Wow. So you get to go ride with some very cool people. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. I get to yeah, I get get to get exposed to a lot of really neat people. Justin, because of his position in Supercross and the motocross world has lots of friends in lots of different uh, arenas uh, and they have passions for motorcycles and dirt bikes guys like Jimmy Johnson yeah so I know you actually have Jimmy Johnson's bike at the shop yeah so yeah you build his bike service his bikes yep and, uh, we've serviced his 2018 450 SXF uh, which he has on consignment at the shop right now and we're building him a 2021 350 SXF yeah, and he's a he's a pretty awesome rider you say he's a really good rider <laughs> yeah uh, I guess he knows how to go fast, right? Yeah, and you know, if, if, if he wasn't so good at NASCAR, he probably could have been a pro uh, dirt bike racer. He's, wow. that, he's that accomplished on a, on a motorcycle. So yeah. yeah. So it's very cool. And you know, the shop is, it, it's a KTM Husqvarna dealership. Obviously we've got, a, we've got the Husqvarna here. Just, if you're not familiar with the KTM Husky brand, I mean, perhaps you could give us a little bit of the history here of KTM, Husky, who they are, what they are. Yeah, so KTM's, you know, history in motorcycles goes back um, to the, the 60s and 70s. Um, a guy named John Penton uh, came up with the idea of having a lightweight uh, dirt bike that really wasn't, that really didn't exist before the late 60s, early 70s. Most of the racers were modifying street bikes to race off-road, and John Penton kind of came up with the idea of, you know, start from the ground and build something purpose-built for off-road and mm -hmm. so that's kind of he partnered with KTM they were a small manufacturer at that point and so they had a very small niche and it's just grown tremendously since then and for a long time obviously it was dirt focused but in the last you know decade decade and a half they've really made inroads into the street scene and in the last four years they've upped the game to the MotoGP level. And they actually have already won a MotoGP yeah. in their fourth season. I mean, yeah. I mean obviously we're not current. Uh, I'm sure a lot of stuff will happen in MotoGP, but last weekend they were leading a race. They got a fourth place. Yeah, um, two yeah. weeks ago they got their first MotoGP win. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which is, if you don't follow MotoGP, to, for a manufacturer to enter into that arena and win within four years is pretty... Yeah, I pretty mean, astounding. Especially when Aprilia have about 54 world championships to their credit, and they've yet to win a MotoGP. And they've yet to win a MotoGP. Yeah, and so. I mean, they are phenomenal. Right. So, yeah, and Kawasaki couldn't do it. Yeah. Suzuki took a while, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. So then, explain a little bit about how, and then you can lead into talking about the TX here. So sure. So, 
KTM acquired Husqvarna in 2013, and the reason I know the day they acquired it was because it was the day before I was supposed to film the initial episode of Neil Bailey Rides, and we were going to be teaching our people on Husqvarna's. And the day before we were set to film, BMW sold it to KTM, so we quickly had to nix that program. So I know exactly when that happened. Yeah, so uh, you know, BMW had bought Husqvarna from Kajiva uh, back in 2009, I think. And that was actually a, a Heinrich von Kuhnheim decision because he was a very big, he was the Motorrad CEO at the time. Right, and, and they he was want, a big dirt biker. And they wanted to get into dirt biking. And mm. so they, they bought Husqvarna, then the recession hit, mm. and it kind of crushed BMW's plans for what they were planning to do with Husqvarna. And so KTM came in in 2013-14 and offered to buy it. And, uh, and since then, KTM's purchased Gas Gas. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they're really focused on kind of dominating that off-road scene. So just in a bit of Reader's Digest version, what is the difference between a KTM and Husqvarna if you're coming to make a purchasing decision? Like, why would you buy a Husqvarna over a KTM or a KTM over a Husqvarna? Yeah, some of it's, you know, historical. Husqvarna has been in the motorcycle industry since 1903. Mm -hmm. They really dominated the off-road riding scene in the 70s. Um, all the world championships. Um, I mean, Husqvarna was winning everything in the 70s. So there's a big demographic here in the United States that remembers Husqvarna dirt bikes as being like the best dirt bikes you could get. So that's kind of what KTM tried to position Husqvarna as. It's, you know, the power plants are very similar, mm -hmm. um, but they're tweaked a little bit uh, for the brand. And then ergonomically and controls are, are different. So um, KTMs tend to be a little bit more uh, racy. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say the Husqvarna's tend to be a little bit more, I would say, like the Gentleman Racer. Mm -hmm. Still super high-end, lots of high-end componentry, but just not as aggressive. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, that's really how you and I met, obviously, was when you asked me a question about my Husqvarna, about the reliability at 200 hours, and I said, well, you know, after 200 hours, it's blown a fuse, <laughs> and uh, this is why we're in a project to give it a makeover, so. Yeah, and so, you know, bring it back to, to Neil's project, he's got a 2016 FE 350 that we're kind of doing that long-term um, refurb on. Mm -hmm. uh, mechanically, the bike is awesome, so a lot of it's just ergonomics and aesthetics, Yep. and simple stuff. Giving her a makeover, yeah. basically. Yeah, getting her back to where she should be. Well, thanks, Terry. So before we let you go, give us the I go, give us the sales spiel on sure. the TX300. What is the, the benefits? What's so great about it? Obviously, we know it's a fuel-injected two-stroke, but yeah. this is a beast. If, if no one's familiar with a, two, uh, a, a fuel-injected two-stroke, obviously, two-strokes have been around for decades and decades, right? It's, you pre-mix gas and oil, you put it in your gas tank, and you, you go off and ride. And you you got your carburetor and jetting and needles. So they work great, but they take a lot of maintenance. And so Husky and KTM developed a fuel-injected uh, option, essentially. And it's a throttle port injection. That's what the TPI stands for. Requires no pre-mixing. You've got a separate oil and separate gas uh, containers, and it mixes right in the throttle body. So it makes riding a two-stroke a lot more similar to riding a four-stroke. Mm -hmm. Just get on and kick it and go. And the TX is a enduro race bike, more yeah. pedestrian, what is the? So the TX uh, terminology for uh, Husky is basically competition enduro, competition mm -hmm. off-road. Um, single track enduro competition based no lights um very very powerful um all about performance yeah not restricted in any way not restricted in any way does it have a different gearing in the gearbox for the the woods or enduro i know they changed the transmission ratios so. yeah so there's a couple different versions they have uh, a w version mm. which is a wide ratio gearbox this one specifically is the is the standard gearbox so uh, more for tighter course uh, mm -hmm. enduro stuff, where the W is for, I would say, more more top end speed. Mm -hmm. um, 
not not something you need when you're doing hard enduro excellent and retail price on the new 2021 uh it's around ten ten thousand dollars excellent so and you know obviously i the reliability from my standpoint has been great and of course my buddy tom who actually has a pendant yeah yep he's they're still around yeah he's got a really nicely restored one maybe we'll talk him into coming on one day it'd be it awesome to, to take yeah and he's been off. riding all the tees i mean in terms of reliability i mean we haven't seen a problem in any of these bikes yeah there are so. they're phenomenal bikes well terry thanks for coming on i hope you guys have enjoyed meeting terry's life i'm a very interesting guy world traveler been all over the place mountain bike racer um dirt bike rider street rider and just uh, the director of fun at 10 cycle so how could you have a better job yeah neil appreciate it very much hey you guys basil here back for episode five and normally you'd expect to see the news right now but you know we got thinking about it there's no news worth watching it's all bullshit it's all bad news so we thought you know what let's do a little section on fun places to ride in north carolina does that sound good thought so so I'm just going to Bob Ross this whiteboard a little bit and, I don't know, talk about some places I think are great, okay? So we've got a map of North Carolina, and then if you're not from North Carolina, it's just Carolina, but there are actually two. And so we're starting from the northern section of Carolina, North Carolina. So here we are in Charlotte, our little hometown. Um, so if you're ever in North Carolina, you want a place to ride, this is my take on it. All right, so here we are starting in the Queen City. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna head out like Brookshire Boulevard, depending on where you are, but we're gonna head to 85 South, uh, which is towards Gastonia. So, 85, believe it's South. And then, um, out towards Gastonia, we're gonna head North on 321. And you know, there might be some some happy little trees over here. Just wherever you want. Just happy little orange trees if you want them to be orange. Okay, and then um, in 321, we're gonna head up towards uh, Highway 40, which is just shy of Hickory, okay? So, we're gonna go, what would that be? West on 40 towards Asheville. All right, 40. And then um, right about uh, Morganton, we're looking for 181. This is where you hit pay dirt, okay? 181 at Morganton. That's Morganton abbreviated. So, a uh, couple little turny turns maybe have on your Googles or whatever, uh, getting through Morganton but we're hitting 181, okay? And so once you get out of Morganton, um, that's where the fun starts. And so it's just these wide open, sweeping turns, just fun are us. And um, there's a couple of, you know, uh, passing lanes if you get stuck behind somebody, whatever. Um, just super fun time. And so on the way up 181, um, you're gonna see a little, uh, a little place you can pull off of the Brown Mountain Lights. Um, kind of a famous place to, uh, you know, go look for, for UFOs maybe. So you could pause there, take a little break. Um, and then you're going to be heading up towards a uh, little Jonas Ridge, um, whatever. And then at the top of the hill, essentially up in the mountains, you're going to be at Linville. Okay. So when you get to Linville, um, Linville proper, you kind of hang a right, and up there you can get up onto the parkway, and also sections of the parkway is uh, the viaduct, which is basically a road that's built above the ground, kind of like a bridge above the mountains and whatnot. So um, really, really cool section. Uh, if you Google viaduct, you'll see lots of just, you know, epic photos. Um, of people uh, doing their thing up there. And then if you come back towards Linville and head towards Banner Elk, which is where I grew up and why I know this section so well, um, cute little town, one red light, right? So you get to Banner Elk, and if you hang a left in Banner Elk, 
that'll take you up to uh, Beach Mountain. Um, another really fun little section, uh, Turney Roads up to the top of Beach Mountain there. So uh, there's Beach Mountain. And you can actually, if you want, you can park up there, hop on the, the lift and ride to the, the top of the resort. And there's a little yurt up there. You can have a beer or whatever. There's actually mountain biking up there in the summertime, super fun. Um, if you hang a right in Banner Elk, that will take you on a really kind of technical turny road towards uh, Valley Crucis. Um, little road there that kind of um, points you towards like Boone, North Carolina. So um, really, really fun sections. And, um, and that kind of covers you from Charlotte to Banner Elk. So if you were to stay west, yes, on 40, that's going to take you towards Asheville. And so, you know, in the Asheville um, Lake Lure area, you know, you've got um, things like Dirty Dancing, you know, that were filmed there, Patrick Swayze, RIP. Uh, great quote from that movie is, you know, if you want the ultimate, you got to be willing to pay the ultimate price. If you want the ultimate, you got to be willing to pay the ultimate price. It's not tragic to die doing what you love. Great film. Um, you also have, uh, what's up there? Um, Chimney Rock, you know, so Last of the Mohicans. Um, great recovery film for, for uh, Daniel Day-Lewis and, and My Left Foot. A um, couple of other epic films. And even farther west is the tale of the dragon. Um, and so uh, you got uh, Sid and Nancy up there who run taleofthedragon.com. Or was it Rob and Nancy? Ron and Nancy. Ron and Nancy, sorry. It was actually uh, Sex Pistols. Oh, that right. Yeah, Sex Pistols. Yes. Um, so, so, yeah. So, that's way out here, almost towards the Tennessee line as far as Tale of the Dragon. But, um, you know, clearly we have so many great places to ride in North Carolina. So let us know maybe if you have other roads you like or give us your feedback if you decide to take these little road trips. And get out there and explore and have a good time. All right? Enjoy yourselves. Be safe. We'll see you soon. And what do we have next, Basil? What do we have next? You tell me. Shameless plug. Oh, right. So. With your travel theme today, um, we have a book by my dear friend Tamla Rich, Hit the Road. Awesome. A Woman's Guide to Solo Motorcycle Travel. And uh, this has been uh, kindly given to us. So lots and lots of great information, um, not just for the female traveler. I think it's, there's some very pertinent information if you are a lady cool. traveling alone by motorcycle on safety and different things, but it's also very useful. Might help you get to Banner Elk. Nice. So that's a great shameless plug. Thank you, Tamla Rich, for this really, really wonderful and well-researched book. She's an extremely detailed traveler and um, extremely competent when it comes to travel and knowledge and America's cool. roadside travel expert, one might say. Cool. So that's very cool. And then this is not technically a shameless plug. This is a giveaway. Awesome. We have seven books by the British author Derek Mansfield. And it's volume three of his travels around the world on a motorcycle. And these really are beautiful. Oh, some nice photos too. Yep, hefty, I think you yeah. should say, right? Yeah. So all you gotta do is send us a message, name, address, where to send us the book, and we will pop this in the mail to you. And Very for cool. seven people to respond, we'll get a free book. And then the best comment on the news will get to this absolutely beautiful travel compass. And if you would like to read the inscription, Adventure begins when you step through the door. Right. So DerekMansfield.com. Very cool. Best comment on Basil's news section <laughs> gets themselves a free compass. So, and that about wraps it up. I think it was a really, really cool episode. Thank you for the travel information on the news. Absolutely. Terry was awesome. The Husqvarna was great. Beautiful bike. And uh, we're looking forward to doing it next time. All right. Thanks, you guys. Some, um, some celebrities uh, chiming in in the comments. Sir Michael Caine uh, was quoted as saying, you don't want to prove you cheese, babe, but do it wheelies. Christopher Walken, we all know him, he chimed in and said, I'll be damned. I don't know who the that was. 
Um, the lead singer of Def Leppard is actually an avid motorcyclist. He said, Beep, be the gaddy, bleed the bloody, oh! Which, when translated, means expect the unexpected. Uh, Matthew McConaughey, um, when I ride, I like to take my shirt off. I'll be damned if I'm gonna ride around in a tank top and flip flops. 